I think I'm going to just sit here in my living room, enjoying the Christmas atmosphere. I'll warm my hands by the fire here. We see all the little um, decorations, the things that we think of at Christmas, the Christmas tree, the stockings. There's stuff in this one. Presents. I got my little uh, joy mug that I'll be drinking from if things get a little slow. I think when we see these things, it brings back the, the uh, thoughts and ideas of Christmas that inspire us. And when I think about Christmas, I think about three things that are significant in making an amazing Christmas. Memories, expectations, and actions. Memories because memories can be an anchor of something solid and meaningful in our life. Or memories could be something that weigh us down. Expectations, because expectations could lead us down a path of the greatest fulfillment that we could experience in our life, or expectations could lead us down a road of disappointment. And then actions, when you think about it, actions, at the end of the day, it's what we do that fuels the desire, the, the goals in our life that moves us toward reaching those things. So I think about memories. Memories, we have good memories. We've got bad memories. Maybe when you think of Christmas, you think of good times. You think of time with family or friends. Or you think about um, great moments, gifts given, gifts received. Or you might have uh, some bad memories, as many people do. Sometimes there are just seasons of life that are difficult. Go through difficult times with friends and family, or maybe you've been through um, some times where you were lonely or just different seasons of life. Some memories are just kind of random. They're just memories, and you can add the meaning to it yourself. I have a couple of memories when I think about Christmas that stand out to me. And one memory is, I don't know if you know this about me, but in the mid-70s, I had a job for about six weeks as a Santa Claus yeah. in a mall here in Los Angeles. And so uh, I lived in Venice Beach, and I drove my clunker car from Venice Beach about five days a week to North Hollywood, to where Macy's is now off the 170. It used to be a, a small mall, and so I was the Santa. And so uh, I have a picture to show you in case you don't think I'm being honest here. <laughs> you can see I have a real touch with kids, can you? She's having a great time. And uh, it was kind of fun. And then uh, one Sunday, uh, I left my apartment in Venice, and my car broke down. I couldn't get it going. I was dressed as Santa. <laughs> so I get out of the car, and I go to a bus station, or a bus stop, and I get on a bus and dressed as Santa. And I, they dropped me off near UCLA, where another bus station was, and I... I waited there for 15, 20, 30 minutes, almost 40, and I thought, okay, I'm not going to make it. Then somebody comes by and says, well, on Sunday, the bus doesn't stop here. So I started hitchhiking as Santa. Can you believe that people don't stop to pick up <laughs> Santa? During Christmas, I was so frustrated with people. I'm just like, if you wanted to move your gauge from naughty to nice, this would have been the chance right here. But no, nobody's picking up Santa. And uh, after it's over and I look back on it, that would probably be pretty creepy to see somebody <laughs> hitchhiking as Santa. So as a public service announcement, don't pick up hitchhikers that are dressed like Santa. So then I took a taxi. And uh, I spent more money getting there than I was going to make that day. 
so I could be Santa. It was funny. And then uh, I was into it. I had this costume, so I went to, uh, at Christmas, I went over to my sister's house in Orange County. And so we were opening gifts, and uh, my little niece was, um, you know, young and w would enjoy this. So they get, got me some gifts in a bag, and I went out the back and changed clothes, and I came around and knocked on the door, and they go, oh, let's answer the door, see who it is, and there I am, ho, 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 you know, and I think out this bag, and she's like big wide eyes, and I pick her up, and I sit her down, I'm like, let's see what's in this bag, you know, I'm giving my best Santa voice, and she's looking at me, and she goes, is that Uncle Philip? <laughs> I said, ho, 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 everybody says that. Because your Uncle Philip is so amazing, but no. But anyway, that was a memory I had. And I also remember, um, not too long after that, I had a, a pretty rough year. It wasn't my best year. And uh, I spent Christmas Eve day with some family in Orange County, a little awkward day. And so I got home to my apartment at 11 o'clock on Christmas Eve, and I was locked out. I didn't have my key. The door was locked. The manager's gone for Christmas. <laughs> I'm like, oh, great. This is Merry Christmas, you know. So I, I got, got a hold of one of those 24-hour locksmiths who came in and let me into my place. Funny things that happen around Christmas. Memories. And you can put memories in a perspective that either makes you laugh or it discourages you, but it's what we do with our memories that, that counts. I try to reflect on good memories and bad memories and decide what is it that I want to change. And I want to create memories that are stronger than the most negative memories that I might have. And so when I think about memories, I think about we have good ones and we have bad ones, but if bad outweighs the good, then it's time to create memories that you will remember for a long time. I think about the scripture that tells the story in Luke about the announcement of the birth of Jesus. It's found in Luke, and I want to read this to you. They'll have it up on the screen for you here in a second. And it says, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel assured them, reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Well, that created a memory they'll never forget, those shepherds. I don't think they would talk about that later and go, I, I don't remember that too much. That is a memory they'll never forget. Um, and then following this good news to Bethlehem, and they go and they see Mary and Joseph and this stable and the baby and... Um, you know, it's interesting how when we think of the nativity scene, it's, all, it's so nice and calm. All is calm. All is peaceful. There's Joseph and the baby and the animals and Mary. Her, her hair is beautiful. She has makeup on. Everything looks beautiful like you do right after you have a baby. And <laughs> um, I, I look at that picture and I think, you know, I was at the birth of both of my kids, Jordan and Paris, and there is nothing similar to my experience there than what I see in these pictures at the birth of Jesus, because all was calm, and there were angels, and well, there was kind of a glow around Holly's head like Mary, but other than that, it was totally different. And um, the point is, 
it's really not the way it was when we look at these pictures of the nativity scene. It's the view that we decide to focus on. And when it comes to memories, um, we can decide what we're going to pull from it. Is it going to be a lesson that sours us or is it going to be a memory that inspires us? Because sometimes even the worst memories we can say, well, I'm going to make sure that other people never have that experience by what I give to them. Or we can say, well, I've had a bad experience and I'm going to let that keep me down. I know when Holly tells the story of the birth of our kids, it's a whole different story. She's like, oh, it, was pain. it wasn't that much pain at all. You know, we just had the baby and it was all amazing. And I was like, well, not from my perspective. I, I saw it. I'll never forget what happened. So let me tell you my version. Not now, but. So um, I think about the best memories I've had. It's about making Christmas great for other people. Really, when I think about the Christmases, when I, when I sit in my chair at home next to the tree drinking from my joy cup, <laughs> I think about times with my family, my wife, my kids, moments that we've shared together. And um, often I don't really think about the gifts that I got. Sometimes I'll think about a special gift that we worked at to, to give to them. But it's those kind of memories. Um, I have memories of, over the years, Holly and I have invited some of the single people in our church that aren't going home for Christmas to come over and spend time with us. And, and I just remember those times. I don't really remember gifts that I've gotten, but I remember those people that we bring in just because they're extended family and we, we reach out to them. One Christmas that stands out to me is a time where Oasis uh, Church planned for six months and we went to Uganda and we provided a Christmas for over 2,000 orphans. So what we did was we had uh, gotten gifts together, we had shipped them, we had uh, taken some with us, we had planned, we'd sent somebody over two or three times in preparation and then we went over there and had parties for a week, for about four different nights, different ages of kids, and, and we had a Christmas party for the college students, the high school students, the, the toddlers, and, and it was an amazing time. I got a couple of photos from that, too. This is Santa Malcolm, who is uh, running things in our tech room right now, and uh, so we were there, and this is, we had jumpies and prizes, and Everybody got backpacks full of stuff, and it was so fun because they never had a Christmas like that in their life. They might get a little something here and there. It's more about celebration with people, but um, to this day, when I go to Uganda, to Watoto Ministries, they say, this is the church that did Christmas for us. I don't remember what I got that year for Christmas, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is what we did for somebody else. And uh, so those are the things that make memory so powerful and that accent what Christmas is all about. The other idea is expectations. Expectations can lead you down a path of fulfillment or if you have unrealistic or negative expectations, it can lead you to disappointment. Sometimes we have Christmas experiences as a child, and we have expectations that are childlike but not very realistic. When I was a kid in South Carolina, I was raised in Greenville, South Carolina, or lived there for about four or five years, and I was one of five kids. So there's five of us and two parents, seven in the family. And so you know how parents are. They, they get gifts from each brother to each brother and sister. And so, you know... Seven people get seven gifts, and sometimes there's a couple extra in there. So you do the math. Seven times seven, it's like 27 or 72 or something. I don't know how it is. But anyway, it's a lot of presents. And so uh, kids would come over to our house, and they would look and go, wow, look at all those presents under the tree. And as a kid, I'm thinking, yeah, this is Christmas. Tons of presents. And then when I got older, 
and everybody had moved and gotten married, and it was like me and my mom and my stepdad, I look and go, man, Christmas not like it used to be. There's not many presents. Because I had expectations of where's all the excitement? Well, it's a mathematical issue. The expectations were unrealistic. Then my expectations turned around when I realized um, what's going to make Christmas amazing is the, having the expectation of looking for an opportunity to bring something special to somebody else. Because we have expectations that we think that the Christmas season, maybe for some of us, just would be an effortless journey of peace and joy. Just whatever we do, it's just going to come upon us. But really, it's a little unrealistic to have that kind of expectation because there's something that we can do about it that makes it powerful. Sometimes we have the expectations that um, our joy and our peace has nothing to do with the environment around us. That is unrealistic expectations. We have to manage the environment that we're in and, and we're going we're gonna, to um, put ourselves. It's just like the expectations sometimes that Christians have where we think, well, because I'm a Christian, things should be smooth sailing. It just doesn't work that, out that way. And um, so I think about expectations and what changes expectations for me is gratitude. Gratitude. Being thankful. Being grateful. Um, and it sounds like such a simple thing, but ingratitude and contentment can't live together. And sometimes we allow our lack of gratitude to steal joy and contentment and peace from us. And to really put ourselves into a place of where we're thankful for what we have right now is an incredible journey, a decision. It's not just saying, okay, I'll, I'll be grateful. Not just deciding, but really taking it deep to your heart to where you thought, you know, I'm happy right now with what I have and with what I don't have. I have to work on that. I don't know about you, but for me sometimes, um, I'm focused on things I would like to see and what I'd like to have and what I'd like to do. And if you're not careful, we have a tendency to get into that place of discontent and we lose the power of gratitude. A year ago, I got this tattoo on my arm. I was in Jerusalem with Holly and I just had... Um, Holly thinks I'm so predictable, but I shocked her by going, I'm going to go get a tattoo, and got it done right there. And um, to be honest, I, I, this, oh, this means blessed <laughs> in Hebrew. It means blessed. When people ask me what that means, I make up something different according to what we're doing at the time, but it actually means blessed. And the reason that I did that is because the Bible calls us blessed people. And to be really honest, I put it there as a reminder and a focus of what God wants to do in my life. But you know what? Um, what I've come to realize in the last couple of months is what this needs to be is a reminder of not what could come, but what is right now. This is a reminder of, hey, man, you're blessed. Don't worry about what you don't have or what they did say or didn't say or what you wish you could do. But I'm a blessed man. Yeah. I'm married. I got a beautiful wife. I have kids. I got a family. I got a job. Uh, I have an avenue of ministry that helps people, other people in their life. I'm blessed. And if I didn't have any of that, I have Jesus. Right. I have salvation. Yeah. My eternity is taken care of. I'm blessed. And I realize that now I can turn that expectation to a place that honors God and keeps my heart open rather than this expectation of if things would just get better, I would be happier. If, if things would turn a little bit, then I would be blessed. And, and what I realize creeps into my soul is ingratitude and discontent 
And I go, what happened to that peace? I'm a believer. I'm worshiping God. I love Jesus. It's because I, haven't, I, I lose that opportunity sometimes to be grateful for the way things are and the way things aren't. To trust God in the midst of all that. If there was a negative part of Christmas, it would be the materialism that our culture focuses on. And, and hey, as human beings, it's easy for us all to get into that zone a little bit where it becomes about stuff and it comes about things and we get, get a little materialistic ourselves. And with that, we get over into that area where the enemy uh, tempted Adam and Eve and the area where he tempted Jesus. And that is, if I just had more, I would really be better off. You know, that's one of the things I've learned going to Africa so many times, is I always think if, if I could bring them some more stuff, they would be really happy. But you know what I find is that they're happy before I got there, and while I'm there, and when I leave, no matter what I give. And I always go away feeling inspired by watching them, because I realize how much I base my happiness on the stuff I have or don't have. And so, the idea that things are going to make me happy, it's always good to kind of keep yourself in check so that that doesn't become the whole spirit of it. At the end of the day, a lot of the things that we talk about at Christmas, trees, presents, stockings, lights, even you know, Santa Claus, and in the Bible, though, even the wise men, all of those things are, might be good and have its place, but they're all on the periphery of the priority, the main thing. The main thing is Jesus. The main thing is that God loved humanity so immensely, and he saw them in such great need that he wrapped his son in human flesh, and sent him to the earth so that he could walk among us and love us unashamedly. To teach us courageously, to confront injustice boldly, to love us like we've never been loved before or since, to die for us, to raise from the dead, and to give us salvation. Pay a price so that every single one of us are free from every failure, every mistake, every transgression that we've ever made. That's what Christmas is about. That's what could allow us to sit here, instead of looking at all these symbols and somehow because of emotion or memories or expectations find it lacking, when we think about the whole priority, Jesus, what could be lacking when he's given us our salvation. Expectations. The last thought is actions. We have memories, we have expectations, and we have actions. You know, when the shepherds heard the news from the angels, I wonder what would happen if they just said, wow, that was quite an experience. And they just sat around the fire and talked about it and went to town and told people, guess what happened to us the other night? But they went. They heard the message and they went to Bethlehem. They took action. Imagine what they would have missed if they didn't do something. If they didn't take action and go there. They were there. They, could you imagine the opportunity to see the the birth, the Messiah. But I think it would be understandable. We could just say, wow, that was a mind-blowing experience. One angel, then a bunch of angels, and the, cloud, the sky lit up. I will never be the same. i got to sit down and rest. But they took action. And action is essential because we talk about gratitude Maybe what you could do with the actions, your actions in the next few days, is to discover gratitude in your own life. 
Because it doesn't matter if you're tall or short, if you're rich or poor, or if you're good looking or have a great personality. We all have all things, all of us have things that we can be grateful for if we stop and notice and take a look. And so discovering that gratitude really discovers a whole other measure of fulfillment in our life. And maybe the action that you take is not only an action of gratitude, but maybe it's an action of trying to create a memorable Christmas for someone else. You know, we, every Saturday, we go out uh, into the community, meet here at the church and go out and serve in different ways. Maybe instead of letting the heaviness of the season overwhelm you, maybe you could come out and do something to help somebody else. Maybe it could be uh, forgiving someone in your life. Maybe it could be a family project that you do together. Maybe it's something that you could come up with. What is a project that I could do? Who in my life do I see that could use a blessing that I have the means to do, provide for them? The action that makes all the difference. I think the most important action that we could take is making room for Jesus in our Christmas, making room for Jesus in our life because that's the priority that's what truly we're celebrating I don't know maybe you've had a bad experience in church maybe you've had a bad experience among Christians maybe you think well I like the idea of Jesus but I'm gonna have a little resistance I have a little check here because I don't want to get too involved I've experienced some bad things you know Jesus came to give you life, to give you freedom, to give you love. Don't let the failures and the human weaknesses of other people steal a great opportunity from you to enjoy Jesus himself in your life. I was just recently told a story about a woman who was, uh, it was in the evening and she was in her car and she'd started the engine and she heard a man over to the side yelling, stop, and he started running toward her. So she rolled up the window, and he's still coming. She locks the door, and then she's like, okay, I got to get out of here. So she puts it in drive, and as she starts to go forward, flames burst out of her engine, and smoke comes up, and so she slams on her brake, and then it hit her. Oh, he wasn't trying to hurt me. He was trying to help me, and I want you to know that no matter what you've experienced, God is not trying to hurt you. He's not trying to bring something bad into your life. He's trying to help you. And so don't let your fears and your worries interfere with the opportunity that God wants to bring something amazing into your world. Make room for Jesus. Could you imagine the idea of being in the middle of a war A real war where people's lives are being lost and all of a sudden, randomly, peace breaks out. You know, that's exactly what happened in World War I 100 years ago in 1914 on Christmas Eve. There was a battle going on near the border of Germany and as Christmas Eve arrived, the soldiers were close enough to each other opposing armies where they could hear the other side start to celebrate Christmas as Christmas Eve. They could hear each other singing Christmas carols and laughter going on. And it was unorchestrated, it was unorganized, but it was as if a truce broke out without any effort and in one instance one of the German soldiers in a deep baritone voice sang Silent Night and the song echoed throughout and all the soldiers started to sing along and both 
armies were singing Christmas carols together. A truce took place. And the next morning, they, they knew that Christmas Day was going to be a different day. That nobody said anything, but there would be a day of peace. And so, little by little, the soldiers came out of the trenches and moved toward the common ground, which is what they called no man's land, where many soldiers had lost their lives in just the last several days. And they came together, and they brought not weapons, but gifts. They gave candy to each other and tobacco products and, and gifts to each other, and they laughed and they joked, and, and they, they, a game of soccer broke out. They had some beer. They were, the armies were celebrating as if a war never took place. And then, the next day, December 26th, when the leaders of both armies heard what was going on, they um, gave the command to fight, to keep going. And the war started again. Isn't that interesting? That in the midst of a war, peace would break out. It seems kind of weird that there was peace right there. And then as if it never happened, they went back to a battle. And I really think that that's what could happen in your life and in my life. Is that we're in this Christmas season and we stop and we sing about Jesus and we talk about peace and we talk about priorities. But it's quite possible that December 26th or 27th, we could put all that aside and go back to the battles that we fight every day, every week, every month, and go on as if Christmas never happened. But let's think about the memories, the expectations, and the actions, and let's make room for Jesus to live in our soul and in our life. Let me pray with you. God, I thank you so much for the most amazing gift that could have ever been given, Jesus, the Savior, the Son of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace, our Messiah. Lord, I pray that every eye would be opened, every heart would be softened to the presence of Jesus, to the love of God. And I pray that just like in that time where they were busy and there were so many things going on, heavens parted and God got the attention of people to say I have good news for you I've got great joy for you I have peace for you tonight I pray oh God that you would just pull back set aside the noise and the distraction so that we can hear from heaven the love of Jesus the message of his peace, of his presence in our life. And in this moment right now, if you would just keep your heads bowed in, in an attitude of prayer, I'd like to extend an opportunity to you tonight to make a decision, to take an action and create a memory that you'll never forget, and that is tonight to put your faith in Jesus Christ, to make room for him, the Bible teaches us that the eternal position of Jesus is available to you. He's knocking on the door of your life. And it show, says that he's saying to us, here I am. I'm standing at the door of your life. And if you'll open that door, I'll come in. Maybe tonight you could open the door of your heart and make room for Jesus. This is not about church and religion and if your family's Christian or not, if you've been to church or not. This is about you as an individual. Have you ever said, I'm opening my life today and putting my faith in Jesus? That will create a memory you'll never forget. That will change the expectation of your life. That will be an action that brings heaven's blessing into your soul. I want to lead you in a prayer. I want to pray for you 
if you would like to put your faith in Jesus Christ tonight. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pray a prayer, a sample prayer out loud. And if you would like to um, invite Jesus into your life, put your faith in him, I want you to just pray silently. I want you to, as I'm praying along, just say, yes, God, that's me. That's my prayer. That's what I want. And I know something. God hears the prayers of your heart. So I want you to say something like this in your heart. God in heaven, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you love me so much that you sent Jesus. And it's this Christmas season that I'm going to make room for Jesus. And I'm going to receive the greatest Christmas gift, Jesus. Today, I'm putting my faith in him. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of sin and cleanse my life. I, I ask you to fill my heart with your compassion, with your grace. From this day forward, I'm going to follow you. Use me, oh God, to be a light to others. In Jesus' name. I wonder with your heads bowed and eyes closed, just one more moment, if you would just let me know. If you could in this room say, uh, Philip, you told me to pray along with you quietly, and, and I want you to know that I did that. I prayed quietly, but, but I want you to know I really meant it. It wasn't just a process, but it's something I really meant with all my heart. I wonder if you just let me know that you uh, prayed that prayer and meant it by just raising your hand real quick, wherever you are all over the room. Just put it up real quick so I can see your hand. Uh, put it up real high so I can see. I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Somebody with two hands up, they really meant it. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and up in the balcony. Uh, I can't see those, but there are ushers up there. Father, thank you for those that raised their hand. I ask you to bless this decision, protect their faith. Let this be a Christmas they will always remember. In Jesus' name, amen. Could you give some encouragement to these people who put their faith in Jesus tonight?